No? No Episcopalians? What a shame. He said, oh, I go to the Anglican church, which I guess is linked with the Episcopalian church over here, because obviously the queen is, is head of the church. And so, you know, given my feelings about 1776 and all of that, it just seems like a good idea. <laughs> so, I do like Baptists too, but that's a whole other issue. So, in the Kyrie eleison, what people stand up is they say something in Greek. They say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. That's what it means. But that's not what's actually written down in this passage at all. Because although they would have spoken Aramaic, the Gospel of Luke, as you probably know, is written in Greek. What the second man prays is actually something very different. What he actually prays is, Lord, helastatoi moi, which in Greek basically means, Lord, be propitious to me. At the temple, every morning and every evening, there was a service. People sang, they then, whatever, there was then someone would stand up at the front and they would say something. And then, when that bit had finished, there'd be a sacrifice. A lamb would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. After the sacrifice was made, the priest who'd done the sacrifice would go sort of through the back of the temple to burn incense. At that point, no one could see anything. It would be like if I walked off stage. So at this point, what would happen is everyone would bow their heads in the congregation and just start praying. So imagine, if I left the stage, you wouldn't be able to see me. There's no point just sitting there doing nothing. So you'll probably bow your heads and start praying, oh Lord, may that man not come back again. <laughs> So at this point, he would go and burn incense, and then eventually he would come out. That, that's, everybody knew that. That's why if you read the Gospel of Luke, when you get in, in chapter 1, in verse 10, it says, when it came to Zechariah's turn to go and burn incense, all the people stood outside praying. Okay, in Luke 1, 10. Of course, everyone knows that. Whenever the priest goes in to burn incense, everyone stands outside offering prayers. And that's the setting here. Two men go to a religious service. The sacrifice is made. The priest goes in to burn incense. One man, who's very sure about his own righteousness, stands there and says, God, I'm better than everybody else. Fantastic. The other guy beats his chest, looks at the floor, and literally prays, may this propitiation, may this sacrifice, may it be for me. May this sacrifice for forgiveness of sins, may it be for me. Literally. May the forgiveness which has been made possible, may it be for me. And Jesus said, I tell you, that that man went home having been made right with God. You see, there's something that we need to understand about when we talk about being sure of going to heaven. You see, there are two different ways of being sure about anything. Let's suppose that my wife and I have a disagreement. And, you know, let's suppose I'm definitely in the wrong, which obviously never happens. <laughs> it's hard when you're perfect. <laughs> but let's suppose we've had an argument, I'm in the wrong. Well, there are two ways I can get myself out of that hole. Number one is, I can try and somehow make myself righteous. Does that make sense? Do good things. Somehow do a whole host of services, whole host of things I think that somehow will make it up. Buying things, maybe I'd even go to great extremes and even put my dirty laundry in the laundry basket in our bedroom, something like that, that I normally never ever do, just to indicate the fact that, you know, I'm now being a good boy. Does that make sense? To earn the credit back. That's like a self-righteousness, does that make sense? I am now trying to make myself right with her. I'm now engaging in a course of actions, and when I think I've done enough, eventually the guilt feelings pass away, I'm okay now, I've rescued the situation. That's how the first guy who prayed is thinking. God, look at me. Sure, I may have done some bad things, but I'm doing really well. God, I'm giving you a lot of money. I'm not just giving you 10%. Okay, he was giving more than the strict 10% he needed to give. Okay. He said, I'm leaving my life. I'm a good guy. I'm okay. He's making himself right before God. The second guy who prays, he prays very differently. Let's go back to the whole thing about with my wife. I can remember hearing a guy, John Piper, use this illustration once. It was very interesting. He said this, he said, look, he says, supposing you, know, you have a fight with your wife. Okay? He says, you know, she storms out of the room, she goes and stands downstairs. Okay? He says, you follow her down into the kitchen. Okay? He says, you can almost cut the atmosphere with the knife. You know what I'm talking about? He says this, he says, what needs to happen here? The answer is plain, she needs to apologize. Oh no, I need to apologize, sorry. <laughs> and ask for forgiveness. That would be the right thing to do. But here's the analogy. Why do I want her forgiveness? so that she'll make my favorite breakfast, so my guilt feelings will go away, so there'll be good sex tonight, so the kids won't see us fighting. It may well be that every one of these desires comes true, but there would all be defective motives for wanting forgiveness. What's missing is this. I want to be forgiven, so I'll have the sweet fellowship of my wife back. She is the reason I want to be forgiven. I want the relationship restored. Forgiveness is a way of getting obstacles out of the way so that we can look at each other again with joy. You see, the second way, to find yourself back in relationship, in right relationship with someone, is you have to say sorry. 
And at the heart of the Christian gospel is the concept of repentance. That the only way to become a Christian is you can't be born one, you can't be raised one, you can't just simply achieve it by going to church enough and having your card stamped. You can't buy it, you can't earn it. But you can come before God and say, sorry. Now there is a big difference between the way that I apologize to my wife and the kind of repentance that comes, that's been won from me by God, because there is a difference. Okay? Normally, if I've upset my wife, she's upset with me and angry with me, and I go, and if I'm, so long as I'm contrite enough, does that make sense? So long as I am genuinely sorry, and I genuinely say sorry, my sort of sorriness earns her forgiveness. Does that make sense? And in most cultures of the world, that's how we think about forgiveness, right? So let's suppose, you know, Mark Toon, he's the senior pastor here. So, you know, let's suppose, you know, we do the Q&A, Mark decides he'll like to ask a question. And I look at him and I say, Mark, that's a stupid question. You have the intellectual capacity, more commonly associated with forms of pond life, <laughs> invisible to the naked eye. So let's suppose and that's my response, and let's suppose for some very bizarre reason he takes that to be insulting. <laughs> and after everyone has left, and you've all gone back to your cars, and Mark's sort of sitting there, sort of slightly stunned, I go up to him, pat him on the back, and say, sorry about insulting you publicly like that. Well, let me ask you, if I insulted you publicly like that, after everyone left, I slapped you on the back and said, sorry, would you forgive me? No. Hey? Most of you are prepared to be honest. No, you wouldn't forgive me. But let's suppose I insult you publicly from this platform. And as soon as the words leave my mouth, I go silent. My bottom lip begins to tremble. My eyes well up with tears. I fall down on my hands and knees. I start wailing and sobbing uncontrollably. I crawl over to where you are sitting. I hold onto your ankles. And I beg you to forgive me. Now would you forgive me? Oh, some of you are very hard to please, I can see that. <laughs> but you will forgive me when you feel I have been contrite enough, sorry enough, sad enough. Does that make sense? When I have sort of like suffered enough inside, emotionally. Make sense? And then, then okay, I will forgive you. Because in our cultures, forgiveness is earned. Make sense? But that actually is not the kind of forgiveness that's at the heart of us understanding of what it means to become a Christian. The Christian gospel isn't, look, You've messed up, you need to be sad about it. If you're sad enough and contrite enough and you come and you clasp onto God's ankles and you beg and you wail and you cry and you do all the other things you're meant to do, then eventually God will forgive you. That's not how it works. The way it works is, before we knew we needed to be forgiven, God offers a sacrifice to make forgiveness possible. Before we even knew we needed to be forgiven, God comes and finds us and offers us forgiveness as a gift. The nearest analogy will be me insulting Mark and me not being sorry about it at all. And him coming to me and making it clear through the most gracious and kind means possible that he was happy to forgive me. And he offers me forgiveness as a gift. And the way you accept that kind of offer of forgiveness is through repentance. You say sorry. Sorry doesn't become the means by which you earn forgiveness. Sorry simply now becomes the means by which you receive forgiveness. And it is inherently humbling. Two men went to the temple to pray. One sees the sacrifice that makes the offer of forgiveness possible. It stands in front of it and boasts about how wonderful he is before God. The other one casts his eyes down, beats his chest, and cries and says, may this be for me. I need this. Jesus said he told this parable to people who trusted in themselves and in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. True Christian conversion is inherently humbling. It's not incidentally humbling. Humility isn't something you do on the side. There is something inherently humbling about genuinely coming and receiving that kind of forgiveness. Which is why Jesus said, you should be able to tell true Christians by the fruit you see in their lives. You should be able to look in their lives and see this. And it's on that basis you may then be sure. Look, let's suppose he... I'm sorry I keep picking on Mark, but he's probably the most secure person in this build, but secure person in this building because it's his church. He's the pastor. Having said that, that may make him the most insecure person in this building. So <laughs> at the end of this time, a few of you who believe in Jesus will gather around Mark and pray for healing. So let's suppose in again, let's go back to the scenario where I've insulted him. And you walk out, you go back to your car and you, you're talking with who came in, you say, I can't believe that guy. That guy from England, the nerve of it. First of all, he thinks that Americans should end their revolution and rejoin the British Empire. <laughs> and then he starts insulting our church leaders. I mean, who does he think he is? So let's suppose, you know, you, next day you see me, I'm downtown in Seattle, I'm having a cup of coffee. And uh, you walk up to me and you say, oh, Michael, I, I was there last night. And you say, 
how are things between yourself and Mark? You know, it seemed a bit touchy last night. And I say, oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. It's incredible. Well, that would be very arrogant and presumptuous, unless it was the case that Mark came up to me at the end and made it very, very clear that he was happy to forgive me. And as I talked with him after all of you had left, I did repent, and I did receive that forgiveness. And if you've received someone's forgiveness, you know it. Have you ever been in a situation where you've, you've offended someone? Maybe you didn't even mean to. You go to apologize the next day, you say, look, I'm so sorry about what happened, and they say, it was nothing. And it's clearly something. Have you ever experienced that? I mean, it's very annoying, isn't it? Because you know you're in the wrong, you know you shouldn't have done it. You're trying to say, look, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong. And they're going, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. But actually, it very clearly is something very big. Similarly, you may have had the experience where you know you have to apologize. You go to someone, you say, I'm sorry. And they say, I forgive you. And the next time you see them, it's abundantly clear, isn't it? You're not forgiven. You only need about a second in the room with them, don't you? You walk in within a second. You can look at them and you know whether there has been genuine restoration of relationship, don't you? You know. Well, that's what it's like with God. We've all done things that we shouldn't have done. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, he makes it possible for us to be forgiven. He offers us forgiveness as a gift. It's called grace. In the face of the offer that he makes, we then repent and we receive his forgiveness. Repentance is the means by which we receive the forgiveness he has offered and we put our trust in him, our faith in him. We now have relationship with him. And you know, the next time you come into his presence, whether it's there or not, and it's not presumptuous, because you either know him or you don't. You're either in that relationship or you're not. But the reason you're in that relationship has got nothing to do with you at one level, because it's got everything to do with him. He was willing to forgive. He was prepared to forgive. He made the provision for forgiveness. He offered forgiveness. The question is, have you accepted it? And if you have accepted it, then you know you are forgiven, and you know with whom you will be when you die. Not because anything's great about me or you, but because there's everything great about him. Do you know that kind of forgiveness in your life? Becoming Christian is an inherently humbling process. It should work itself out into every aspect of our life. And what we're sure about is not ourselves. What we're sure about is him. That's why Paul writes, I know whom I have believed and am convinced. He's sure of the one in whom he has trusted. Certainty comes, it's not arrogant. You're now in a relationship with him. I have no idea how long I talk for. (laughs) I think about like nine minutes ago, I phased out momentarily, but I was able to keep speaking. (laughs) I'm I'm back with you now. (laughs) Am I on the other side yet? Okay. (laughs) And so I think I'd like to end it there, if I may, because I'd like to give you opportunity to ask questions. I realize that there are going to be sort of a couple of groups of people here. Okay? There may be people here, you've been invited by a friend, you're not a Christian. I'd love to be able to give you the opportunity to ask your questions first, if that is possible. So if you are visiting, then please do be bold you know, to write out your question or come to the microphone early so that this evening may do everything it can for you. Now, it may be that you're here and you're a Christian and you fall into one of two camps. You've come here and you've absolutely loved this evening, even though it's now quarter past four in the morning for me somehow this made sense. In which case, I'd love you to ask me questions too. Now, the third group of you are Christians who came here and you think, why did I come here and I hated this? In which case, if you could sort of just leave your checkbooks and visa cards on your seats and head out the back door, that would be great. But I would like to 